Richard Phillips retells a story in his commentary that on November 27, 1989, it was the day when communism fell in Czechoslovakia. And that day, a Methodist church in Prague erected a sign for the first time. For 50 years since Communist Party had come into power, they were forbidden any publicity or outreach in the city. With this new emerging freedom, the church posted for the first time three words on their sign. The Lamb wins. And it wasn't because Jesus had unexpectedly gained victory over the fall of communism, but that he had always been reigning in triumph, even during communism. Richard Beuse says this, Christ is always the winner. He was the winner, even when the church seemed to lie crushed under the apparatus of totalitarian rule. Now at least, it could proclaim it. Today, we start our new sermon series on the book of Revelation, entitled, Following or follow the conquering lamb. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Maybe you're excited I'm preaching the book of Revelation. Maybe you're not. not. But here's what the book of Revelation is not. It is not a secret prophecy code that will reveal specific events and moments that will tell us when the end of the world will come. It is not that. Christians have, have for a long history, particularly in the Western world, in America, have over-interpreted or hyper-interpreted the symbolic visions in Revelation and applied them to current events. If you're looking for me to do that for you, you've come to the wrong place and you are not reading the book of Revelation correctly. What the book of Revelation is... It's a symbolic vision for every generation of the church that provides hope and a challenge to God's people. It provides hope to us, and it provides a challenge to us. In fact, after I get done with these 50-odd sermons that I'm going to do in the book of Revelation, you're going to get tired of it because it's going to be the similar message over and over again Jesus wins. It reveals, the book of Revelation reveals God's promise that Jesus will return and conquer and remove all the evil in the world. All things will be restored. Amen. It reveals history's pattern. History's pattern. This is what Revelation reveals. That all human kingdoms become like Babylon and must be resisted. I'll say that again. All human kingdoms will become like Babylon and must be resisted. Here's why I'm going to even apply it harder for us. Even the United States, all earthly countries are corrupted by sin. The kingdom of God, in Revelation tells us, it penetrates all all of these countries, it supersedes them. It, the kingdom of God has no boundaries. It has no barriers. And it seeps into every one of them. It's visible and visible. See, here, here's what Scripture is telling us, and Revelation is telling this pattern of history. It is the church that lasts forever. Not the countries or nations of this world. We may or may not be a Christian nation, but in God's government and his rule, there's only one kingdom, one king, and there is no subset of any countries, empires, etc. Period. Listen, I want to be very clear. I'm not anti-American. It may seem like I'm anti-American. I'm not anti-American. I'm very happy that I live in this country and I get the freedoms that I get. And then I can stand here and preach all this message. I'm just very pro-kingdom of God, and I think we all ought to be, and I'm pro the church with all its faults and flaws that God redeems his people. 
the church, which is what the book of Revelation is pushing us to understand. The Bible Project quotes it like this way. Every human kingdom, like Babylon, eventually becomes corrupt and oppressive. We should resist evil kingdoms by loving people, trusting that Jesus will not let evil go unchecked. He will return to remove evil from the world and makes all things new. Now you've understood the book of Revelation. Human kingdoms are actually, this is actually important to understand. Human kingdoms and countries are not our enemies. This is more important biblical understanding that Revelation points us to. There are all these human kingdoms which are corrupted by evil and become like Babylon are just shadows of this spiritual battle between Satan and the forces and his forces and God's people. And Satan and his evil forces are using all these human institutions to wage a battle against God and his people. Ephesians 6, 12 says it this way, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So all of these, these things that we're going to see in Revelation, these symbols and these empires and these dramatic visions, all, all pointing to us that these are just symbols of a spiritual, a real spiritual battle that is manifested in each and every generation that you and I, God's people, must come to terms with and that Jesus wins. Revelation provides a hope and a challenge. The challenge that Revelation provides to us, Revelation 2, 9 through 10, I know your tribulation, Jesus says, and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus repeats this message over and over again in the book of Revelation. He says this, you will suffer. This is what evil does in this world. It provides suffering to God's people. And we all experience it in various forms, in various degrees, in various moments in our life. And people in this world experience it more than most of us right now. And Jesus says, this is the promise. You will suffer because of this. But the challenge, he says, is be faithful. Be faithful in your suffering. The challenge us is to be faithful, or uh, another way he says it is conquer. This is a, a repeated message. Be conquerors. And Romans says, be more than conquerors. And, that, and this conquering, you're going to understand, is, is actually be faithful to the truth and to Jesus. So, how do we be faithful? How do we conquer? This is the message. We follow the conquering lamb. We follow Jesus, who is our hope. We are to be faithful like he has demonstrated to be faithful while he was here on earth. We are to be like Jesus. We are not him, but we are to follow him. The hope, that's the challenge. That's the repeated challenge in the book of Revelation. The hope that Revelation provides in Revelation 5, 5 through 6, says this, and one of the elders said to me, this is a vision that John is getting. I want you to hear this. This is what he heard. This is what he heard. Weep no more. Behold, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. That's a powerful message. So that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. I'm going to tell you this later, but the scroll is the, the uh, opening of the scroll is the revealing of God's kingdom entering into the world. That's what the vision is of this repeated scroll and says, he says, look at weep no more. The lion is here. He has conquered this powerful, mighty lion. He's going to open the scroll, the seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw John heard that the lion is going to conquer. And then he saw immediately this. I saw a lamb 
standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And before you get confused by all the sevens, just breathe symbolic messaging. But I want you to connect. He heard a lion, powerful lion that conquers. But what actually happened is he saw was a lamb who was slain, who was the conqueror. Interesting, isn't that? Jesus is the lion and the lamb, the one who is mighty in power, but he actually is mighty in power because he's the lamb who conquers by dying on the cross, by being slain. That's the hope. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, immediately followed this, say, worthy are you to take the scroll to open up the one who opens up and lets the kingdom of God enter into this world to open its seals for you were slain. He's worthy because he's the slain lamb. And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom, a priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. From all across the world, from all time, the slain lamb is the hope in which he brings a people together for one kingdom that lasts forever. That's our hope, is the slain lamb who conquers. The challenge is to follow the slain lamb, to be faithful like him. The book of Revelation reveals our hope that Jesus wins, or more specifically, the conquering lamb wins and brings justice and ends all evil. And this book repeatedly challenges us to follow the lamb, to endure persecution to endure evil much like the lamb endured evil, to lay down our life, to love our neighbors, to be a servant, not with physical might or abilities, but the way that Jesus served. The way of Jesus is the way of the cross, is the way of his people. Jesus wins by the cross and we follow Jesus. Which brings us to the prologue of the book, which is the scripture verse of today, verses 1 through 3, Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. There's four things that this prologue is telling us. Four things that is going to help us understand the book of Revelation as we go further in it. The first thing is that this book is an apocalyptic prophecy. It's a pastoral letter to churches. It's a gospel testimony, and it's a means of a blessing. It's a unique book because it's not just a letter. It's just not an apocalyptic literature, and it's not just a gospel. It's actually all of these forms of literature combined into one, and it's important as we read it to understand all those things. The first thing, apocalyptic prophecy. So we get this word apocalypse. The first word in that says is revelation. That word revelation here is the word apocalypse in Greek. That's all it is. And this is what that word means. It means like an unveiling of something hidden. Uh, Much like imagery, if you had like a piece of art and you're revealing for the first time, and so you have a cloth over it and you you reveal it for the first time. Like that's the, the unveiling is the Apocalypse, the revelation, the revealing of it, or like a, if you want to think of it or, or as a magic trick, right? Surprise, there it is, the revealing. Anyway, that's, that's what revelation means. This, but this book is not merely revealing the final days of history. William Henderson calls it the unveiling of the full plan of God for the history of the world, especially the church. So what this book is really talking about, it's a revelation to the church. This is history, and this is who you're supposed to be. 
Apocalypse, this apocalyptic literature puts this book in a specific type of ancient literature that you and I do not have today. We don't write in apocalyptic language. It was apocalyptic language that developed in Israel during the time of the exile, when God forced his people into exile. And you could think of books like uh, Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 2, that is apocalyptic literature, or the book of Ezekiel, uh, which is apocalyptic literature. And here's what I will tell you about apocalyptic literature. Here's your distinct features about that. It's usually very clear that an angel delivers dramatic visions and symbols including numbers, the numbers in the Revelation are not literal, they're symbolic, to depict, to depict a spiritual reality. So these visions and these uh, grandiose uh, dramatic symbols are to evoke a spiritual reality, good versus evil. These symbolic visions reveal a heavenly perspective on history. So in some ways, Revelation is trying to reorient our perspective, not from our perspective, from human perspective, but like reorient it from a spiritual perspective, from God's perspective, to give us a, the understanding of the final outcome of history using Old Testament images. So as we go through this book, Revelation exclusively uses Old Testament literature, which was the scripture of the day for the people, and so we're going to have to stop sometimes, go back and understand the reference, because I'm sure that not all of us are totally familiar with all the images and the scripture references that it's using. We're going to have to go back to Daniel, to Zechariah, to Ezekiel, to understand what are the images that this angel gave to John so they would understand, because a lot of these images would have made under sense to these people, because they would have had the references to the Old Testament on the tip of their tongue, or the tip of their head. I'm blurring the metaphor there. Apocalyptic literature is usually written to an oppressed people. Right? I told you it comes at the time of the exile. So when people are oppressed, the message of hope Goes, it goes out bursting into the history saying, listen, I, I know you are oppressed. There is hope and there's a challenge in this moment. So it's, it's not just a, a simple prophecy. It's a stylized form of prophecy that's heavily symbolic that's using the Old Testament rep references. And I also I know when I use the word prophecy, most of us think it's foretelling the future. That is not what prophecy is primarily in Scripture. Even the Old Testament, that is not what prophecy is. Prophecy is not pri primarily, it is not primarily foretelling the future. But J.K. Beale says, prophecy is primarily forth-telling and giving exhortations. So when a prophet speaks, he's not usually telling you, this is what exactly is going to happen. He's usually telling, if you obey, this is what's going to happen. If you disobey, this is what's going to happen. So usually a prophetic message is an exhortation, do this. And what the exhortation, the foretelling prophetic message in Revelation is, follow the conquering lamb. Be faithful in the midst of your persecution, in the midst of your suffering. So Revelation is apocaly apocalypse is a book that is, over, is encouraging us to overcome and conquer in the present moment. Anytime it's read, that's what it's meant to do. That whatever the moment is, be faithful. Be a conqueror. Right? So it's an apocalypse. That's what the, this prologue tells us. It's apocalyptic literature. But this is actually even more important to understand that this is a pastoral letter. In verses 4 and 5 going on, you're to see this, that it begins as an epistle letter. This is the prologue, and the next thing that happens, it introduces itself as a letter. Much like the letters that Paul writes in the New Testament to all the churches, Paul, when Paul writes a letter, even Romans, and all these letters that Paul writes, he writes them to a specific people, to a church, in a specific circumstance that's going on. And so it's very important for us when we read Revelation that we understand the specific circumstances that are going on because this is not just one letter. It's actually a letter that we're going to see that's right to seven different churches. 
that has seven different issues going on. Which is important to understand that this is a letter written by the Apostle John. We know it's the Apostle John, who is the beloved disciple of Jesus. At this point, he was in, he's been imprisoned and exiled on the island of Patmos, which is just off of uh, Turkey. We know it's written in 95 AD. You can see there, specifically it's written, as you see those in, in the red, those are the seven churches. That, this is modern-day Turkey, by the way. All right, that it's written to these seven particular churches. It's written during the 95 AD, during the reign of Emperor Domitus, uh, which is, comes after Nero. Domitus, it particularly begins at the end of his reign, heavily persecutes Jews and Christians. And so this book is written to a people that is beginning to experience extreme persecution for what they believe. So John writes this specifically to seven churches, seven letters to seven different churches. But we know the number seven is used over and over in the book of Revelation. This number is highly symbolic. Even though these are seven specific churches, seven is this number that means complete or perfection. And so this use of that, it's written to seven specific churches, but is written as one letter to seven different churches is mainly to understand that this is a letter that's universal written to the whole church for all time. So even though it's important that we understand the historic moments, we also want to understand that it's for us. Understand the context, but this letter is for us, just as all Paul's letters are for us, and just as John's letter here is for us. So it's best viewed, even though it's seven letters, it's one letter to a timeless universal church. And the message to all the churches and to the universal church is going to be repeated over and over again, which is what? Follow the Fall, right? Remain faithful. Follow the conquering lamb. Remain faithful. That is conquering. It's not, this is not the message. It's not the message that Jesus is going to remove your temporary circumstance or going to remove your temporary suffering or pain. But the promise is that there is everlasting hope and justice, and Jesus will one day wipe it all clean and make all things new. It's apocalyptic literature. It's a pastoral epistle to us, and it's a gospel testimony. Revelation 1, 1 through 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants the things that must soon to be placed, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So I just want you to hear how this, this is how it went. God, through Jesus, gave this message to an angel, and the angel gave it to John, who was a witness to the word of God, to Jesus. He was his friend. He saw him die. He saw him rise. That he lived this afterwards. That he saw him ascend to heaven. John is a witness to this. And this is a testimony to this fact of Jesus. This is actually how uh, we understand divine inspiration of scriptures. God, through Jesus, gives it to an angel who gives it to a person. And for the New Testament, it is an apostle or a person directly connected to an apostle that he gives these New Testament scriptures to, the ones that were closest to Jesus. This is how we understand divine inspiration of God. I can't convince you that it's divinely inspired, but that's what John is proclaiming here. And it's a, this message is a proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. And what's that good news? Jesus wins. It's the good news of Jesus reigning over history to save his people, the church. And this is actually important to understand Revelation, that it's telling us a history. History has a beginning and an end. And it's not just randomly formed that God creates history with a plan. 
and that throughout every moment of history, he is orchestrating things to happen and that they will have an end. This is his story. And that, that's not the etymology of the word history, by the way, but that's, you know, it's a fun little cliche to say. This is, his, this is history is his. And he's trying to communicate and accomplish something and do something. And for that, we all actually know who he is. History is the very creation so that people can know who God is. It's the means in which he reveals himself. And Revelation is revealing that, that history has a beginning and an end, and that God is the sovereign ruler over everything. There's not a moment in history in which God is not in control, that he's not ruling, that he's not triumphant. Nothing is outside of his control. So your circumstance, your moment, your identity, your suffering, your joy, your pain is not beyond him. He is in it. He knows it. And he is using it to reveal who he is and that he is triumphant and that he wins. This is the good news that the conquering lamb wins that he will make all things new. Are you tired of that message yet? May you never be tired of this message. It's apocalyptic literature. It's a pastoral letter. It's a gospel testimony. And number four, revelation is a means of a blessing or means to a blessing. Revelation 1.3, it says it very clearly. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Ruby, you've been blessed today. <laughs> and blessed are those who hear. You've been blessed too. <laughs> and who keep. That remains to be seen. What is written in it, for the time is near. You see, pastoral epistles were letters that were carried by messengers. They, we didn't have, they didn't have Xerox machines back then. They didn't have uh, book presses that they could just mass produce these letters, right? They didn't have email. They couldn't send, they didn't have text messages. They actually had to write this letter down and give it to a messenger who had to travel to these seven churches and read aloud this message. So it's a blessing to that messenger. Blessed is the one who takes upon this task to actually read it because they were meant to be read aloud and reminded people over and over again. The epistle is meant to be read and it's meant to be heard. It's a duty to actually hear this. It's actually a duty to preach this. We can imply that. And it's meant to be, keyword, kept for all ages by all people. The message is to hear and to keep this message, which is why there's going to be 50 plus sermons in this, partly because it gets some complicated visions in there that we have to break down. Partly because well, I want this message over and over again. I told you you're going to be tired of it. Jesus wins. Be faithful. That's the message that God is giving through Revelation. And that we are to keep this message over and over. And that cannot be preached enough in my life. Be faithful. Be faithful no matter the circumstance. That the clear message is for God's people, no matter what you're fearing, that Jesus is triumphant. He's triumphant right now. More specifically... It's the conquering lamb that wins. And that we are to follow this conquering lamb, which means we are used the methods and his ways to be faithful. One of the messages we just sang, like I, I said it last time we sang, the battle begins, right? We, the way that we begin to be faithful is we, we kneel down and we pray. Because we understand it's not our battle, it's his battle. And he's the victor, not us. And also how Jesus, he picks up his cross. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. Lay down your life for others. And then it has, two times it says something similar to this. The time is here. And I want to point out to you, it's not necessarily the saying that the return of Christ is near. It's more like when we're thinking about in the Gospel of Mark, when the kingdom of God is near, or the kingdom of God says at hand, which is really the message, that's what it's really saying here, is the time is at hand. The time is now what? The time is now to be faithful. Now 
it, this is the timeless message of the book of Revelation. The time is now to be faithful. It's not to, hey, Jesus is, it's, Jesus is coming back. It's not telling you when. In fact, the gospels tell, make it very explicitly clear. You will not know when. He's going to come like a thief in the night. Don't try to understand when you know. Here's what you are to do. Be faithful. Trust in him. The time is now for us to obey. It's always tomorrow. It will be time for us to obey. The next day after that, it will be time to obey. And the obedience is to listen, to keep this word, to be faithful. The time for us is to be faithful. The time for now is for us to follow Jesus, following this conquering lamb. Like this Methodist church in Prague, communist Prague, may we have the courage to proclaim the lamb wins. The lamb wins. In this battle of good versus evil, there is no real battle. It gives visions of a battle, but there's no real battle in the book of Revelation. The clear message is the lamb wins. He's already won. He's always winning. He's always triumphant. Just as that quote, as Richard Buse says, Christ is always the winner. He was the winner even when the church seemed to lie crushed under the apparatus of totalitarian rule. Now at least it could be proclaimed. Listen, brothers and sisters, we can proclaim it. We are in a place in this world that we can fearlessly proclaim the Lamb wins. There are others people in this world who are still being faithful that know the truth that the Lamb wins, that they might not have the ability to easily proclaim the Lamb wins. They might do it in other ways besides the way verbally we so easily do it. But that doesn't change the fact that here, uh, here we can say the lamb wins. In the caucus regions of the world, the lamb wins. In the far reaches of Russia, the lamb wins. In the deep south of the United States, the lamb wins. In the recesses of your heart, the lamb wins. No matter what circumstance or moment no matter how disobedient you've been. Now is the time to hear and to keep the gospel messages of the book of Revelation. Jesus has won. Jesus is winning. And Jesus will win. It is his victory. And it is his battle. May we be people that discover more and more what it means in these following weeks and the rest of our lives, what it means to follow the conquering lamb and to be faithful, to trust in him no matter what. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, I give you thanks. We give you thanks for this simple and clear message that's going to be repeated over and over again. Lord, give me new ears and a new heart to hear it over and over again with joy each and every time. To, re to remove the, the mist and the cloud of the circumstances of our lives, the distractions of our lives, to understand that it is our job to be faithful to you, to trust in you, that it's your battle and that you wins and you even conquer our own heart. Lord, I pray. I pray for that message to continue to penetrate my heart, the heart of the, you and the heart of this church and the church universal, for people, for our children, for this community to hear it clearly that you penetrate their hearts and that they know you and we know you more and more each and every day. Lord, give us the strength to be faithful today and then tomorrow. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen.